This is Russ Brialt with the Shroud of Turin Education Project. And, and on today's Shroud Report, we have a special guest, Paul Maloney, who is a research archaeologist. Paul, welcome to the Shroud Report. Thank you very much. You've been studying the Shroud for a long time. And um, we, one of the things we were discussing before that really interests you the most is kind of the, the mystery of the Shroud. Indeed, it is a mystery. And you yourself have been kind of a detective in this whole subject for a long time. Well, I like the way you put it uh, as a, a mystery and detective work because it's truly that. Um, my favorite part uh, has been as a research archaeologist, and this is how I got involved, uh, was as studying the pollen grains mm -hmm. that were found on the shroud. Uh, we have a uh, man that was involved in the shroud research from long ago, Dr. Max Fry. And he was like a, a detective who actually investigated mm -hmm. the shroud by studying the dust, dust particles, just the plain old dust that you would see on your table. In this case, it was on the cloth. As he peered through his microscope in 1973, he said, may I have permission to take samples of dust? So that's what he did. He got involved with his microscope and began to examine all the particles, all the fibers that he found on the shroud just the simple dust just the simple dust now in that dust he found uh, as I've already said particles of linen and cotton he found pollen grains he found uh, uh, anthers from the actual centers of flowers he found plant hairs that come from alongside the stems mm -hmm. as if those plants had been laid right physically on the shroud and uh, he found actual insects in this case mites two mites I found uh, from the material that he took in 1978 that uh, are actually technically found in the floral material of the of the uh, pollen grains so there's flowers there's mm -hmm. pollen there's insects there's hair there's a lot of stuff and I'm, tiny little leaves we call bracts that are also involved and much of this is microscopic can't even microscopic. see it with a human that's eye. right you can't see it with the naked eye you have to have a microscope now here is a pollen grain uh, you can see the little tiny protrusions that go all the way mm -hmm. around the pollen grain uh, we know that this is a floral pollen grain that is it comes from a flower it doesn't come from a tree so pollen from a flower okay mm -hmm. and here's another one you can see those little things that that stick out mm -hmm. from them uh, that's typical if you look under a under a microscope and you see this kind of ornamentation on a pollen grain you know it came from a flower here's a bract this is a tiny little petal uh, comes from what we call an inflorescence and you call it a a brack a bract b-r-a-c-t b-r-a-c-t uh, right okay. and uh, this is the kind of thing it, the the narrow end is the end that was attached to the plant mm -hmm. and uh, many of these would uh, figure all the way around the plant as a tiny little flower. You'd almost have to have a microscope, at least a high-powered magnifying glass, to see the tiny flower. Uh, goldenrod mm -hmm. is an example of the kind of plant that this would have come from. Okay. Now, here's a plant here. Now, this would have come from alongside the stem. Um, it's the type of thing that you find if you, you were to lay something down on a cloth and this would break loose, this would be impregnated into the cloth. So that's not something then that would necessarily, I mean, pollen sometimes floats in the air, but, but that right. would indicate that, that, that the flower was actually laid onto the shroud itself? That's right, and that's okay. why this is so important. Uh, it's important to realize that not only the wind deposited some of the pollen grains we find on the shroud, but also human activity, mm -hmm. physically laying flowers down on the shroud itself. We're going to take a break right here, and we'll be back in just a minute. The Shroud of Turin Education Project offers a live, big-screen multimedia presentation for all audiences. For more information on how to sponsor presentation in your area, call 770-716-7114 or email us at shroud2000 at aol.com. Check out our website at www.shroud2000.com. 
Help bring the mystery and the message of the Shroud to your community soon. This is Russ Brial with the Shroud of Truth Education Project, and welcome back to the Shroud Report. And today we're talking to Paul Maloney, a research archaeologist. If there are flowers and flower images and pollen right. for, from flowers, uh, when you think of a burial today, I right. mean, you send flowers to the funeral home. Mm -hmm. You put flowers on the casket, and that's a tradition that goes back thousands of years. That's right. That's right. And so one of the theories is that, is that if this is the shot of Christ mm -hmm. that we're talking about here, then perhaps along with spices that they, that they brought, mm -hmm. they also brought flowers and, and perhaps banked the flowers around the head of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of the shot or maybe the entire mm -hmm. body? That's the first of two possibilities okay. for human activity, uh, the burial activity and the laying of flowers down during that activity. The second is that if this is considered by the followers of Christ later years to have been the burial cloth of Jesus, they often used flowers particularly in the Eastern Rite to lay flowers down on the what they call the epitaphios, literally laying the flowers down. I have a Coptic no, no, friend. No. What is what is the epitaphios? What the epitaphios is a piece of embroidered cloth. Now that's rather late in historical tradition. Okay. But the earliest cloths that we know of that were used on altars go back to uh, at least Pope Sylvester, which would be around the three in the three hundreds. A.D. Okay. And if they used flowers in that Eastern Rite on those altars, that could have been the source in a liturgical setting from which they get the, the dust from the flowers themselves and the plant parts from the flowers themselves. Oh, I see. So that the, that the shroud itself may have been used in an early liturgical type right. ceremony. In a church. Uh, in a church where, a it, was, service. where it was uh, draped over the, over the communion table? Yes. Isn't, isn't that what? Exactly. I, okay. Yes. And so the, I've, I read this one time that, 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 that this whole... Uh, idea when you go into a church, uh, oftentimes you you see the communion table mm -hmm. is covered with this with this long linen cloth, yes. and that began you said with Pope Sylvester back in the fourth century, right? And well, that and that is supposed to represent the shroud, exactly, okay. as his burial cloth. Because and yeah. and that and that's where you place the communion elements, the the right. bread and the wine, symbolizing yes. the body and blood of Christ, and of mm -hmm. course. If the shroud is in the shroud of Trin is indeed the burial shroud of Christ, mm -hmm. and that also contained mm -hmm. the body and blood of Christ. That's right. Okay. And still today, in the Eastern Church, they place flowers or petals of flowers on on the epitaphios. Even today. Yes. Now this tells us this takes us into uh, another area. How did the image of the man of the shroud get there mm -hmm. and that has plagued the minds of a lot of detectives in this great mystery that really is the central mystery of the that uh, is. of the shroud now a frenchman a pharmacologist by the name of dr jean roche volcranger proposed that the inside books when you open a book and you find the stain of plants that mm -hmm. have been kept there and many herbariums and even people who just save plants in their library, uh, put them in a book and put them on the shelf and leave them there for years. When they open them, they see this imprint. And you can see here's a, here's a fern on the one side. On the right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, and then on the left is the imprint from that fern. Now that paper has picked up that image. Mm -hmm. Now one of the features on the shroud is that the image on the shroud is three-dimensional. Let's take a look at what a plant might look like in, under a VP8 image analyzer, which has been used to, right. to evaluate the image in 3D. Okay. Now, this is an example. It's not the same one that I just showed you, mm -hmm. but in your mind's eye, visualize that this has a counterpart in the way of a Volcranger pattern. You put this in under the... VP8 image analyzer, take a look. Everything you put under a VP8 
always will produce an image. Right. And it will sometimes, to the untrained eye, look like it is three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. But now take a look at the edges here. Notice how the edges rise up and there's what appear to be veins right. in the center. And notice that those veins are higher. They seem raised than, up. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. This tells you that this has genuine 3D coding Distance in the information. image. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, this is a contact print, obviously, because mm -hmm. it was in, in some book or on some piece of paper in a herbarium. But you can see because of the veining in the cent so center, is it that, moves. Why is that then? Why, why, would that, why would a contact print have three-dimensional qualities? Mystery. Mystery. We are back to the mystery again. Okay. Now, Dr. Alan Mills in England has proposed uh, some ideas he thinks might explain it. But as of the present time, we still do not know. Okay. Hypotheses are available and they need to be tested. And Dr. Alan Mills now, is, is there some kind of radiation that's at, 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 at work here in the creation of these plant images? We don't know. Okay. It may be strictly chemical. Is it what? What, what, what is? Um, uh, I, I've, I've read things about that. Uh, that this is referred to as a coronal image. This is not a coronal image. Okay, this is not a coronal. This image. is a contact image. You're going to show is, me a coronal image next. I, I am. I am shortly going to show you okay. one. Okay. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. In fact, let's go to that right now. I want to show you the man, though, who is the one who investigated coronal images. This is Oswald Scheuermann. That's right. Of uh, near uh, near uh, Nuremberg, Germany. This man used German coins, and he used what he calls what we now know today as a uh, Kirlian photography. Mm -hmm. uh, it was done by a, it was invented by a Russian scientist, and uh, Scheuermann used. Kirlian photography to take this coin and then what he did he laid it on cloth mm -hmm. and then he applied his electrical discharge unit which produced a coronal image and now this on cloth is the coronal image of the coin you just saw I see mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now uh, this looks a lot like what you see on the shroud right similar coloration that's right and um, and is it now, is, is when, when you look at something like this, uh, what, are, what are some of the other qualities that this would have that would be similar to the shroud? Well, uh, Scheuermann has demonstrated that it also has three-dimensionality to it. It is, okay. Right. And he has even explained it by, he did an experiment by tilting a coin on a tiny little uh, prop and then getting the high point, which was on the low side, and the, and the uh, distance point up here, because it was tilted mm -hmm. off the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, cloth. And then he did his Kirlian photograph and demonstrated there was distance information from that tilted coin. Wow, OK. Well, this is why it makes it so difficult for us to decide whether Jean Vaucranger was correct with his contact print, right. which contains distance information, or whether Scheuermann is correct. Now, there are other, other proposals as well that may also have distance information, but uh, these are two that we can illustrate here today. Right. So these, both of these examples would indicate that, that the image on the shroud uh, perhaps can be explained by some kind of radiation transfer? The first view, the Volcranger pattern, would be strictly a contact print and a chemical interaction. Okay. That would not be radiation. Okay. The second view, the coronal discharge, may well be radiation. But now I'm not a physicist, so if you want to delve into the physics, you'll have to get another detective who specializes in the detection of physics. And uh, we have several of those involved in shroud research. Well, that's just fascinating stuff, Paul. It really is. And um, we're, we're going to take a break right here, and uh, we'll be back in, in just a minute. Buy a copy of this episode for $14.95 plus $5 shipping and handling through our website at Shroud2000.com. Books, videos, posters, and other resources are also available, including curriculum guides for school use. 
plus information on how you can sponsor a live multimedia presentation in your area. Check out Shroud2000.com, the official website of the Shroud of Turin Education Project. This is Russ Brialt with the Shroud of Trin Education Project, and welcome back to the Shroud Report. And today we're talking to Paul Maloney, a research archaeologist. Paul, we were talking during the break about so many different avenues of science that have been employed in the research and analysis of the Shroud. What are what are what are some of the some of the avenues that, that have been used so far? But I think, Russ, I once counted some 61 or 62 sub-disciplines of research that have already been applied to the shroud itself. And it ranges all the way from art history to classical history, uh, all the way to chemistry, uh, hematology, uh, physics, uh, textile, textile chemistry itself. Um, You've got botany and, of course, palynology, which is a study of pollen that comes from the plants. This whole range, and including my field of archaeology, have been applied to the shroud as an example. That's just phenomenal how much research has been done. I read once where there's been over 250,000 scientific man hours employed in the research and analysis of this thing. That's not surprising. And now, in recent years, they've applied microbiology, and, we, and that's only beginning. So there's many, many more man hours ahead of us to try to unravel this great mystery. Now, before we were talking about the pollen and 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 now, uh, Avi Noam Danin, um, mm -hmm. uh, Israeli botanist, and 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 he at the Hebrew University, mm -hmm. and also uh, Yuri Baruch, I believe, yes, is, a pale, is a paleontologist, and. Um, are you familiar with their work and maybe you can yes, tell me Yes, in fact, what... what they've done is really quite exciting. Now, Dr. Alan Wanger has proposed 28 different images, floral images, embedded in the shroud cloth itself. Mm -hmm. So what has happened is that uh, over the years, and these were based on Dr. Fry's researches, Dr. Danin, and later he brought his colleague uh, of uh, Yuri Baruch into the picture, mm -hmm. studied the shroud. He went so far as using binoculars in Turin itself to evaluate the floral images that he saw. Mm -hmm. And he could confirm the presence of a specialized plant. Now remember, we, we usually use Latin terms, so this right. is Zygophyllum uh -huh. demosum, which grows only in Israel and Lebanon and the Sinai Desert. Wow. That's the only place it grows. The image of that is on the shroud. Here's a professional botanist actually making that identification from the cloth itself. So you have a, so he is essentially confirming Dr. Al Wanger's uh, uh, view that he's found flower images. And, and, uh, but I, as, as I understand it, uh, Dr. Wanger actually approached uh, Dr. Danin to, to confirm his suspicions. That's on that's it. correct. Okay. So Dr. Dunin has actually been at Dr. Dunin has written seven, eight books on the floral oh, of, yes. of of Palestine. So well, he is a specialist in desert flora. Dr. Dunin is for for Israel. Okay. So he's a, a truly uh, an expert in his field, applying it to the study of the shroud. And and then and then with with respect to the to the pollen, he also found some pollen from a plant that is that is unique to the, the Middle East as well. That made the, the image. image on the images. So I have five different uh, proofs that the zygophilum is there, and zygophilum is distributed uh, not all over the world, but. Uh, if you if you want to see the map, um, this is Gundelia, the, the the plant that we have most of the pollen on the shroud. Yes. Of. This is the area of Gundelia, and this is the area of Zygophyllum. Well, Dr. Fry found six or seven pollen types that are what we call halophytes. Mm -hmm. These halophytes are salt-loving plants. And they are only, they only grow conducively in 
the environment from a desert. So you have to have the cloth in a desert environment or somewhere near in order to get that kind of, of uh, pollen grain on the cloth. And the only candidate for it is somewhere in the Middle East. Now there was a, I, I was reading that, that that there's a pollen on the shroud that that um, that Yuri Baruch has verified as being from um, Grundelia turniforte, I believe is how you say it. That's correct. Which is is from from a thorny plant, right? That blooms in the spring. Right. That's correct. And and, and so so you, you what what they have found is then they they have pollen from a thorn plant that is unique to that part of the country right. or part of the world and then also images mm -hmm. on the shroud that from plants that grow only in the Middle East to it you have these two specialists uh, that are attached to the Hebrew University mm -hmm. saying or verifying that that the, not that it's the shroud of Christ per se but that verifying that this cloth must have been in Jerusalem at some point in its history. That's correct. Now they're not making any uh, attestations about age or dating or, or who's on the shroud, but they are saying that from their point of view, the evidence supports that the shroud was in Jerusalem. Is that? Is that's, that that's right. Well, that's a pretty fascinating piece of evidence to, uh, to have uh, something that can be can independently verify yes. that the that the shroud originated in the in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. and, um, now, we, we, the the Max Fry's uh, findings also tended to support the the belief that the that the shroud was also be, before it ever came to Western Europe in the in the Middle Ages that it was kept in Constantinople and then even before that in Edessa for six or seven centuries. Yes, Dr. Fry pointed to one particular plant that grows only in the area around Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, he identified that plant as Epimedium pubigerum. And from that basis, he suggested that the sojourn had taken the shroud from the Holy Land up to Constantinople and then on over into Italy and France and the rest of Europe. By, by tracing the, the pollen trail kind of corroborates the historical trail right. starting all the way back in Jerusalem. That's or right. whenever it first was in Here Jerusalem. Here was his detective analysis trying to determine what geographical areas the shroud had made its journey through. Right. Now similarly, the cloth of Oviedo he traced through North Africa and across into Spain coming into northern Spain by that way by the same use of pollen right. pollen analysis right and uh, and and we, and we have a known historical trail for for the uh, for the Oviedo cloth which which is a kind of vindicates Max Fry's methodology That's right. that has been uh, I think criticized by some and yet now vindicated mm -hmm. by that and also vindicated by our 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 two uh, our two professors at the Hebrew University right well, with that, uh, we're going to go to a quick break, and uh, we'll be right back after uh, just a few minutes. The Shroud of Turin. In the last 25 years, it has become the most studied artifact in human history. Is it really the cloth that wrapped the crucified body of Jesus? or simply the work of a clever medieval artist. See for yourself at Shroud.com. Hi, this is Russ Brialt uh, with the Shroud Report, and our guest today has been Dr. Paul Maloney. I want to thank you very much for being here. It's a lot of fascinating information that you've brought to us. And I uh, want to thank you for joining us on the Shroud Report, too. And we'll just see you next time.
the image analyzer, take a look. Everything you put under a VP8 always will produce an image. Right. And it will sometimes, to the untrained eye, look like it is three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. But now take a look at the edges here. Notice how the edges rise up and there's what appear to be veins right. in the center. And notice that those veins are higher. They seem raised than, up. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. This tells you that this has genuine 3D coding Distance in the image. Distance information. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, this is a contact print, obviously, because mm -hmm. it was in, in some book or on some piece of paper in a herbarium. But you can see because of the veining in the cent so center, is it that moves. Why is that then? Why, why, would that, why would a contact print have three-dimensional qualities? Mystery. Mystery. We are back to the mystery again. Okay. Now, Dr. Alan Mills in England has proposed uh, some ideas he thinks might explain it. But as of the present time, we still do not know. Okay. Hypotheses are available and they need to be tested. And Dr. Alan Mills now, is, is there some kind of radiation that's at, 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 at work here in the creation of these plant images? We don't know. Okay. It may be strictly chemical. Is it what? What, what, what is? Um, uh, I, I've, I've read things about that. Uh, that this is referred to as a coronal image. This is not a coronal image. Okay, this is not a coronal. This image. is a contact image. You're going to show is, me a coronal image next. I, I am. I am shortly going to show you okay. one. Yes, <laughs> indeed. In fact, let's go to that right now. I want to show you the man, though, who was the one who investigated coronal images. This is Oswald Scheuermann. That's right. Of, uh, near uh, near uh, Nuremberg, Germany. This man used German coins, and he used what he calls what we now know today as a uh, Kirlian photography. Mm -hmm. uh, it was done by a, it was invented by a Russian scientist, and uh, Scheuermann used Kirlian photography to take this coin, and then what he did, he laid it on cloth, mm -hmm. and then he applied his electrical discharge unit which produced a coronal image and now this on cloth is the coronal image of the coin you just saw. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, yes. Isn't, isn't that what exactly. I, okay. Yes. And so the, I've I read this one time that, 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 that this whole uh, idea when you go into a church uh, oftentimes you you see the communion table mm -hmm. is covered with this with this long linen cloth yes. And that began, you said, with Pope Sylvester back in the fourth century. Right. And well, that and that is supposed to represent the shroud. Exactly. Okay. As his burial cloth. Because and, yeah. and that and that's where you place the communion elements, the the right. bread and the wine symbolizing yes. the body and blood of Christ. And of mm -hmm. course, if the shroud is in shroud of Trin is indeed the burial shroud of Christ, mm -hmm. and that also contained mm -hmm. the body and blood of Christ. That's right. Okay. And still today in the Eastern Church, they place flowers or petals of flowers on, on the epitaphios. Even today? Yes. Now, this tells us, this takes us into uh, another area. How did the image of the man of the shroud get there? Mm -hmm. And that has plagued the minds of a lot of detectives in this great mystery. That really is the central mystery of the, that uh, of the shroud. Now, a Frenchman, a pharmacologist by the name of Dr. Jean Volcranger, proposed that the inside books, when you open a book and you find the stain of plants that mm -hmm. have been kept there, and many herbariums and even people who just save plants in their library, uh, put them in a book and put them on the shelf and leave them there for years, when they open them, they see this imprint. And you can see here's a, here's a fern on the one side. On the right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, and then on the left is the imprint from that fern. Now that paper has picked up that image. Mm -hmm. Now one of the features on the shroud is that the image on the shroud is three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at what a plant might look like in under a VP8 image analyzer, which has been used to right. to evaluate the image in 3D. Okay. Now, this is an example. It's not the same one that I just showed you, mm -hmm. but in your mind's eye, visualize that this has a counterpart in the way of a Volcranger pattern. 
You put this in under the VPA. There's insects, there's hair, there's a lot of stuff. And tiny the, little leaves we call bracts that are also involved. And much of this is microscopic. You can't even microscopic. see it with a human That's eye. That's right. You can't see it with the naked eye. You have to have a microscope. Now here is a pollen grain. Uh, you can see the little tiny protrusions that go all the way mm -hmm. around the pollen grain. Uh, we know that this is a floral pollen grain. That is, it comes from a flower. It doesn't come from a tree. So pollen from a flower, okay. Mm -hmm. And here's another one. You can see those little things that, that stick out mm -hmm. from them. Uh, that's typical. If you look under a, under a microscope and you see this kind of ornamentation on a pollen grain, you know it came from a flower. Here's a bract. This is a tiny little petal that uh, comes from what we call an inflorescence. And you call it a, a brac? A bract, B-R-A-C-T. B-R-A-C-T. Uh, right. Okay. And uh, this is the kind of thing, it, the, the narrow end is the end that was attached to the plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of these would f uh, figure all the way around the plant as a tiny little flower. You'd almost have to have a microscope at least a high-powered magnifying glass to see the tiny flower. Uh, goldenrod mm -hmm. is an example of the kind of plant that this would have come from. Okay. Now, uh, here's a plant here. Now, this would have come from alongside the stem. Um, it's the type of thing that you find if you, you were to lay something down on a cloth and this would break loose, this would be impregnated into the cloth. So that's not something then that would necessarily, I mean, pollen sometimes floats in the air, but, but that right. would indicate that, that, that the flower was actually laid onto the shroud itself? That's right, and that's okay. why this is so important. Uh, it's important to realize that not only the wind deposited some of the pollen grains we find on the shroud, but also human activity, mm -hmm. physically laying flowers down on the shroud itself. We're, we're, we're going to take a break right here, and uh, we'll be back in, in just a minute. The Shroud of Turin Education Project offers a live, big-screen multimedia presentation for all audiences. For more information on how to sponsor presentation in your area, call 770-716-7114 or email us at shroud2000 at aol.com. Check out our website at www.shroud2000.com. Help bring the mystery and the message of the Shroud to your community soon. This is Russ Brialt with the Shroud of Trin Education Project. And welcome back to the Shroud Report. And today we're talking to Paul Maloney, a research archaeologist. If there are flowers and flower images and pollen right. for, from flowers, uh, when you think of a burial today, I right. mean, you send flowers to the funeral home. Mm -hmm. You put flowers on the casket, and that's a tradition that goes back thousands of years. That's right. That's right. And so one of the theories is that, is that if this is the Shroud of Christ mm -hmm. that we're talking about here, and perhaps along with spices that they that they brought, mm -hmm. they also brought flowers and and perhaps banked the flowers around the head of uh, mm -hmm. of the shot or maybe the entire mm -hmm. body. That's the first of two possibilities. Okay. For human activity, uh, the burial activity and the laying of flowers down during that activity. The second is that if this is considered by the followers of Christ later years to have been the burial cloth of Jesus. They often used flowers, particularly in the Eastern Rite, to lay flowers down on the what they call the epitaphios, literally laying the flowers down. I have a Coptic no, no, friend. No. What, is, what is the epitaphios? What? The epitaphios is a piece of embroidered cloth. Now, that's rather late in historical tradition. Okay. But the earliest cloths that we know of that were used on altars go back to uh, at least Pope Sylvester, which would be around the three, in the 300s A.D. Okay. And if they used flowers in that Eastern Rite on those altars, that could have been the source in a liturgical setting from which 
they get the, the dust from the flowers themselves and the plant parts from the flowers themselves. Oh, I see. So that the, that the shroud itself may have been used in an early liturgical type right. ceremony. In a church. Uh, in a church where a it was, service. Where it was uh, draped over the, over the communion table. Or? This is Russ Brialt with the Shroud of Turin Education Project, and, and on today's Shroud Report, we have a special guest, Paul Maloney, who is a research archaeologist. Paul, welcome to the Shroud Report. Thank you very much. You've been studying the Shroud for a long time, and um, we, one of the things we were discussing before that really interests you the most is kind of the, the mystery of the Shroud. Indeed, it is a mystery. And you yourself have been kind of a detective in this whole subject for a long time. Well, I like the way you put it uh, as a, a mystery and detective work because it's truly that. Um, my favorite part uh, has been as a research archaeologist, and this is how I got involved, uh, was as studying the pollen grains mm -hmm. that were found on the shroud. Uh, we have a uh, man that was involved in the shroud research from long ago, Dr. Max Fry. And he was like a, a detective who actually investigated mm -hmm. the shroud by studying the dust, dust particles, just the plain old dust that you would see on your table. In this case, it was on the cloth. As he peered through his microscope in 1973, he said, may I have permission to take samples of dust? So that's what he did. He got involved with his microscope and began to examine all the particles, all the fibers that he found on the shroud. Just the simple dust. Just the simple dust. Now, in that dust, he found, uh, as I've already said, particles of linen and cotton. He found pollen grains. He found uh, uh, anthers from the actual centers of flowers. He found plant hairs that come from alongside the stems, right. as if those plants had been laid right physically on the shroud. And uh, he found actual insects, in this case, mites, Two mites I found uh, from the material that he took in 1978 that uh, are actually technically found in the floral material of the of the uh, pollen grains. So there's flowers, there's mm -hmm. pollen, 